Welcome, this is Soil 101, a very brief introduction. And this is sort of my view on soils and what I think are some of the most important things to know. So again, if I don't answer your questions or it comes up, let's take some time and make sure we answer them. I'm gonna to try to stop at six, uh, but I'm also happy to go over and just talk through any questions you have. So I got a PhD studying soil. I'm now a doctor of dirt. And here's my email. You can find me with this. I officially work for Cornell, but I'm still based in New York City. This picture right here is a photo of new soil mixtures that were made at the Wartman Community Garden run by East New York Farms. So we'll talk about that project and all these wonderful things about new soils that are being made in the city. All right, so before I begin, I want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. I want to acknowledge uh, the Lenape Ho King, that we are in Lenape Ho King, the Lenape homeland, and to acknowledge the Lenape, Canarsi, and Warpinger communities, elders of their past and present, and their future generations to come. And also acknowledge that many of the institutions that we are part of, certainly the ones that I've been part of, are founded on exclusions and erasures of indigenous people. And so I want to invite us all to commit to working to dismantle these legacies of settler colonialism in all of our education and research endeavors. I also wanna thank all of you and everyone who grows everything everywhere. We've got our urban growers, but also growers in non-urban areas who we are always indebted to for all of our food and sustainability, but especially community gardeners in New York City really are at this intersection, this forefront of sustainability and environmental justice. And so you all know that you get access to fresh produce, food sovereignty, really important culturally relevant food, physical activity, providing space for community building, use of abandoned lands, reduced waste, and improved air, water, and many different ecosystem services, all these benefits, the environment, we thank you. And so now and always, so many people leading this work are Black, Latinx, people of color, so Black Lives Matter, now and always. So who am I representing? Tell you a little bit more about me. I got my master's and my PhD at CUNY, Brooklyn College. And so some of you may be familiar with their soil testing services there. So that's where I really got into all of this. Um, and over that period, I was working with a lot of different organizations and city agencies um, to try to deal with lead in soil. So we called this the Legacy Lead Consortium. We'll talk a little bit about lead because I can't tell you about soil without talking about lead and other issues that are in our cities. Um, Cause this is my hometown too. Born and raised in the Bronx. Now I'm in Brooklyn, um, but now I just got hired by Cornell. So again, based in the city, but I'm still doing research on soils in our cities and working with people who are doing this amazing work of making our cities uh, environmentally sustainable. So let's talk about soil. What comes to mind? You know, if you all want, and like I've been a teacher a long time, if we can just, you know, we can talk, we've got a small group. I'm just, you know, I'm curious, what comes to mind? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you smell? Oops, let's go back to that. Any answers to this? Dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dirt, or do you say dirt or dark? Dirt. Just dirt. dirt. Yep. Is it like dirty? Is it like gross? Mess. Mud. <laughs> Must. Yeah, mud, messy. <laughs> How's it smell though? Oh wait, Linda, I think you're on mute. Dry. Dry. No, dry. No moist. moist. Mm. Yeah. Can be dry. Could be moist sometimes though after a rain and if it's holding its moisture well, yeah. It doesn't last long. <laughs> mm -hmm. Moisture. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about what dirt, what soil really is? Mm. All right, well, we'll be thinking about that because that's what we're gonna explore. Like what even is this stuff? And if we're gonna talk about it, we have to talk about our whole planet because earth is the only planet we know of and they've searched for like all the planets they possibly can. It's the only planet with soil. Why is that? Why is earth the only planet with soil? So that's this question, how did, how on earth did soil get here? So we got to take it back even in bigger scales. Earth formed 4.54 billion years ago. That is a long time. Think about di dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. We're talking 
billions of years. That's when the earth formed. But there's all these amazing things that earth does. Like it has these plate tectonics. I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, it's, it's like the surface of the earth can move all around. And these, it's from earth's internal heat. It makes the plates move. I learned all about this when I went to college and this is what got me into all this. It's like, wow, the earth is doing all this stuff that they don't teach us so well in K-12, but it's really wild. So the earth's moving from the inside, making the plates move. And then the way that the earth is positioned to the sun, that's what makes the water cycle go. And I feel like water cycle, we're sometimes more familiar with rain, goes into the rivers, it evaporates, it goes back up. But these two cycles together create life. There's a lot of other things maybe too, but it's really this ongoing movement, these dynamics. And so life has existed for a couple billion years, maybe like 3.2 billion years, a lot of Earth's history, but it was only like in the seas and only these tiny microscopic organisms only 500 million years ago, half a billion years, did life live on land? So here's an image. Um, you can't really see what it is. It just looks like a rock. But basically, this is a rock that's holding some of the oldest fungus. So it's about 440 million years old. This Tortubus protuberans. Then we started to get life on land. And that's how we got soil from fungus, from fungi. Question? A package. Oh, we got people off mute. <laughs> um, anyway, so so from the scientific perspective, we can find we have soil because we have life. We have life because we have these big systems of plate tectonics and water cycle. And really the earth is a whole system and it's made up of rocks, water, air, and life, and then soil. And so there's a lot of ways we can classify all of the different rocks of the earth. We can classify all you know, the layers of rocks. We can classify the layers of the atmosphere. We can classify different types of water. You know, most of our water is in salt water. And we only have tiny bits actually, 2.5% of Earth's water is fresh and drinkable. We also classify life in these different categories. Well, in the same way we classify all these systems and they're all interacting at the center, I would argue, there's soil and we classify that too. So there's many different types of soils. They can be broken down in all different ways, but this is the biggest category, the orders. There are 12 orders according to the US system for soil taxonomy. That's like the breakdown of the different types. So I'm not gonna go into all those different types, but it's really wild to realize that soils are diverse. It's not just the same, really anywhere. Right? And you might notice that one foot next to another could be really different. And it depends on all these different factors that we're gonna talk about. So we're also gonna talk about the functions of soil. So here's an image from one of the textbooks that I've used to teach about this, one of these big textbooks. And I've got all the references in the back if you wanna read up on any of this. But basically they show that soil does all these things, promotes plant growth, cycles nutrients, and nutrients you know, are what plant, we need nutrients to live, so do plants. It changes the atmosphere. It provides a home for organisms. We use it for engineering. It purifies our water. And I'm curious, do you notice anything about all these functions? Anything stands out to you? No pressure if it, if it doesn't. Oh yeah, go ahead. It's life. It's life, absolutely. We need this soil for life, absolutely. Anything else stand out? Well, one thing that really stands out to me is how much we make this about us. We make soil about humans. And right, that, well, I'll go, get to that, that this soil serves all these things for the benefit of, of everyone else. But what about soil in and of itself? You know, it's like we talk about what it does for us, oh, for engineering and water purification and supply. You know, I mean, yes, this is for plants. It's not just humans, but it's it's a little bit, uh, the, the term is anthropocentric, human-centric. We're, we're pretty self-centered. So if we're going to talk about soil, I got to talk about these big systems that make it. We got to talk about how it all interacts. And I've also got to talk about our, our social system that we're in. And STEM, which is science, which is what I've chosen to go into, 
science, technology, engineering, and math, that's STEM, that we participate in our economic system of racial capitalism. And so standard science sees the earth and soil as a resource to be used and extracted from. And what happens with this mindset? Soil is exploited. People are exploited. And people who work with soil are particularly exploited. So I think we have to acknowledge that if we're gonna look at what soil is and how it's been used, we have to understand that history and it's ongoing. The legacy is here today. So let's talk a little bit more about what I mean when I say racial capitalism. It's basically our economic system of capitalism, the structures, excuse me, of capitalism are based on this exploitation of land and labor, which are workers. And so there's profits that accumulate or you know, get, get, get to be kept by a very small fraction of the population, the owners. And if you go to this book by Cedric Robinson, he coined this term racial capitalism in the 80s, the newer version came out in 2000. He makes this argument that this exploitation has always been racialized, that differences in race have been used to justify exploitation and legitimize hierarchies. So then it becomes natural and expected that this is just the way it goes. It becomes an ideology. And so racism isn't just this individual targeting or bigotry or prejudice. It's a structure that makes people vulnerable to premature death. So I think we have to recognize that when we're talking about the soil and who works with it and how it's treated, we have to understand this broader system. And so what happens to soil? Often degradation. That's you know, reducing the quality or well-being of it. It can be eroded, it can be uh, stripped off the land and taken into the seas, and it can be contaminated. So my research has mostly been around contamination, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about these other two. And then some things we gotta know about soil to make sure we can prevent all of this. Okay, so this is a lot of text. If anyone feels like reading it aloud, I'm gonna read it because I think it's so nice to hear this context. Um, so this is an excerpt from a, a book called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. And so this is by Dave Montgomery. And he says, normally we don't think too much about the ground that supports our feet, houses, cities, and farms. Yet what is dirt? We try to keep it, excuse me, we try to keep it out of sight, out of mind and outside. We spit on it, we denigrate it, kick it off our shoes. But in the end, what's more important? Everything comes from it and everything returns to it. If that doesn't earn dirt a little respect, consider how profoundly soil fertility and soil erosion shaped the course of history. At the dawn of agricultural civilizations, the 98% of people who worked the land supported a small ruling class that oversaw the distribution of food and resources. Today, the less than 1% of the US population still working the land feeds the rest of us. Only 1% of the population feeds everyone. Although most people realize how dependent we are on this small cadre of modern farmers, few recognize the fundamental importance of how we treat our dirt for securing the future of civilization. Many ancient civilizations indirectly mined soil to fuel their growth, so they're like, getting all their food, they're mining the soil, getting the resources from it. To fuel their growth as agricultural practices, accelerated soil erosion, well beyond the pace of soil production. Some figured out how to reinvest in their land and maintain their soil, all depended on an adequate supply of fertile dirt. Despite recognition of the importance of enhancing soil fertility, soil loss contributed to the demise of societies from the first agricultural civilizations to the ancient Greeks and Romans, and later helped spur the rise of European colonialism and the American push westward across North America. His argument is that when you degrade your dirt, you go looking for it elsewhere. <laughs> you go taking it from other people. So how we treat our dirt really matters. Um, and here he goes, some such problems are not just ancient history. That soil abuse remains a threat to modern society is clear from the plight of environmental refugees driven from the Southern Plains' Dust Bowl in the 1930s, the African Sahel in the 1970s, and across the Amazon basin today. While the world's population keeps growing, the amount of productive farmland began declining in the 1970s 
and the supply of cheap fossil fuels used to make synthetic fertilizers will run out later this century. So unless more immediate disasters do us in, how we address the twin problems of soil degradation and accelerated erosion will eventually determine the fate of modern civilization. So I want to start off with some of that. I don't know if there's any questions about this or you want to stop me. Welcome to those who just joined us. Um, but some more context. If we're going to talk about soil, we've got to think about how important it is and how civilizations have depended on it. And the future of civilizations will also depend on the well-being of our soils. Okay, so there are many people, clearly all of you on this call, many, many people value soil. And something I wanna acknowledge is that while standard science has contributed to this degradation of soil, there've been many efforts for decades to replenish and steward, take care of soil within standard science. Um, many indigenous and longstanding cultural practices value and replenish soil. And something I think is interesting that's been going on is that there's a lot of Western people returning to regenerative agriculture and permaculture, but often these practices take from indigenous traditions without citing them. So I'm not an expert in these types of practices, but I've read some critiques that people are not really citing their sources when they're looking into them. So it's extremely important, particularly in our settler colonial context, that we educate ourselves on the origins of these various practices and that we cite our sources. So my background's more in this standard science, but as you've already noted, I've got lots of critiques of it, <laughs> but, I'm, but I still wanna share what I think is useful from standard science, because I think we can, we can blend all of these traditions together and, and live well and take care of our soils, especially in urban settings. All right, so let's talk about how soil really forms. Again, stop me if you've got any questions about this. So basically, as maybe you gathered, soil is always changing. It's not, it didn't just get here and stay here. It's always developing. So it's this dynamic system. And as you might have gathered from that um, excerpt, it's a slowly renewable resource. So it takes about 2,000 years to create 10 centimeters of topsoil. That's like this much. Some soils are even 100,000 years old. So it slowly, slowly develops over time. That's why it's this precious, it's renewable. It can, new soils can be made, but naturally occurring takes a really long time. Therefore, we need to take care of them. All right, so if we're gonna go to some of these standard scientists, we've got some, some old white men here, um, and, but they've developed this field of pedology, which is the study of soil formation or pedogenesis. It's also the study of soil classifications. I, I showed you those different orders. There's all these other breakdowns below the orders. They also map soil and modern pedology started in the 19th century. So it's really not that old. It's like the 1800s, mid 1800s with this, this man right here with the beard, um, uh, Dokuchayev. He started modern pedology. And in the US, Hans Yeni in the 1940s, again, even younger, started to realize that there's these different factors that contribute to soil formation. People were much more concerned in science with biology and chemistry and physics, and they're like, soil, dirt, right? That, who needs it? What is it? That's just dirt, okay? But then it's like, wait a minute, there's something going on here. Okay, so what are these soil forming factors? What makes soil form? And so this came from Hans Yeni, and really what he looked at were these five factors. So there's parent materials, and this is important if we're thinking about building new soils, there's parent materials, it comes from something, usually that's rocks. It's influenced by the climate, it's influenced by the living organisms present, it's influenced by topography. If you're on a slope, soils will form very differently than if you're in a flat area, and it's also influenced by time. There's now being argued that there's now a suggested that there's a sixth factor, which is humans, because we influence all of this. We can change all of this and we influence all of it. So those are the soil forming factors. And I'm gonna go through each one a little more just to give you some more detail about them. So parent materials, basically rocks. There's three major types of rocks. And if you gathered from the beginning, this is how I got into all this science. I think rocks are wild. 
They tell us everything about our past. Most people are like, what are you doing looking at that rock? What, what, what's the point of that? But let me tell you, they're very interesting and they tell us a lot, but there's, all, there's three different types and that they'll make very different soils. Very, very different depending on what kind of rocks or parent materials are there. So igneous comes from a volcano, sedimentary. You can think about sands layering up, they're sediments. Or metamorphic is like marble. You might, you know, carvings coming from marble. Very, very different. And so marble, for example, um, is made of the same material that lime is made from, limestone, lime, that has a great influence on pH. So if you know you add lime to raise the pH if your soil is too acidic. So all of this determines very different soils. And here, there's maps of all the different parent materials of soils in the US. I mean, it, it really depends where you are. So if you see here glacial drift, it's looking like our whole area is made of, you know, glacial drift. You don't even see Brooklyn and Queens on here. You know, there's fine scale differences if you were to zoom in. All of Brooklyn and Queens is covered with glacial drift. That's these broken down pieces of rocks left here by glaciers. We'll talk more about that later. But Manhattan and the Bronx are sol have solid bedrock. If you go to Central Park or uh, the New York Botanical Gardens, you can see big, big rocks sticking out of the ground. So those are the parent materials there. Okay, so we've got parent materials. Then we've got climate. Climate drastically affects the kind of soils you have. Overall, right, so it, it tells us how much, or it influences how much organic matter. We'll talk about what organic matter really is, but it's crucial to soils. So in general, if you have more rainfall going this way, in general, you'll have more organic matter. Think about the deserts in the Southwest. They don't have very much organic matter, not a lot of rain. When you have cooler temperatures, the hotter temperatures, uh, the, the organisms in soil will eat up all the organic matter more quickly. When it gets colder, you'll get more organic matter. So in general, those two trends um, create more organic matter. Although if you get really cold like the Arctic, then you don't have organic matter either. It gets too cold for any organisms to live. We should maybe define that organic matter. It's not organic like certified organic. It means living or formerly living. It's like we have organic matter as our tissues, you know, and then when we die and decompose, that's organic matter too. So these are general trends also affected by other factors. Then your soils are influenced or determined by what organisms are present. So you can think here about native vegetation, if you've got big forests, if you've got prairies, if you've got mixed vegetation or you've got desert, you know, it drastically influences what kinds of soils are there. So organisms that live in soil include plants, animals, and microorganisms, which is what I've been really getting into with research. These microorganisms like bacteria and fungi, they're in charge. <laughs> They've been here a lot longer than us. They've been making these soils happen. They're, they're really running the show, um, but they're tiny and we can't see them. So we're just starting to really learn about what they're doing. But in general, vegetation or plants affects the quantity and composition or type of organic matter added in soil. For example, in a grassland, grasslands actually have a ton of organic matter below the surface. But in a forest, it doesn't go that deep. Forests only have a little bit of organic matter. Uh, grasslands, you have a deep, deep, deep profile. And forests are very different. Um, in deciduous, deciduous forests are easier to decay. The organic matter there in conifer forests, like pine trees, they're generally acidic and they're the litter or the, you know, the leaves that fall down um, are hard to decay. Deserts obviously have the least amount of organic matter. And so the organisms are always cycling the nutrients. They're the ones who break it down, make it available for new life. So organisms and right, plants absorb these nutrients through the roots. So organisms, huge factors. So you're looking at your soil, what's going on? You can't always see them. Often people are like, oh, we've got worms, we're great. Worms sometimes eat a little bit too much organic matter, but for the most part, you want your organisms in the soil. So there's all different kinds. There's burrowing ones like earthworms, there's microorganisms like bacteria and fungi, and they break down, again, this organic matter to make the nutrients available to plants. Um, we can talk about, you know, N fixing bacteria are really bacteria that will take nitrogen, N, out of the atmosphere, bring it into their tissues, and then when they die, that nitrogen is available to plants. 
So that's like hugely important. We need these bacteria that make nitrogen available. Um, Cause that's what really, we shouldn't be having to buy nitrogen. The, the, the system can do it on its, um, if we're treating the system right. So just to show you some approximate number and diversity of organisms typically found in a handful of grassland soil. Again, this, as I mentioned, in a grassland, you have all, this is this dark material here is all organic matter. And when you think of that smell, I asked about that smell, can smell really good. There's a classic like earthy smell to soil. That's often from bacteria called actinomycetes. And they make this amazing smell that's responsible for, you know, that, or these, uh, chemicals that are responsible for the smell. But anyway, there's just so many organisms. There could be a hundred billion bacteria in that handful. You can have 50 kilometers and hundreds of 500 species of fungi in that handful. 500 meters of plant roots, a few mammals maybe. You have hundreds of species of insects, 10,000 nematodes, which are like these little swimming worms that are could be harmful but aren't necessarily. Uh, lots of protozoa, which are other kinds of single-celled organisms, and algae, which can even photosynthesize hundreds of species. So there's so much life in the soils that we are just beginning to learn how to see with, you know, some of them are too small for your regular microscope. So we're just learning about all these organisms. Okay, and then we've got topography. As I mentioned, if, uh, you know, that's the soil's position in the landscape. So depending on how steep the slope is or how it faces the sun, that will influence how much moisture is in the soil. There's generally drier soils up at the top, wetter down at the bottom, water moves downhill, gravity. This influences how much solar energy uh, the soils get, which then influences what plants can grow, how quickly it's eroded. And so again, erosion could be like, if it's on that slope, it's not gonna build up. It's gonna move downhill, which is erosion. And so there's thin and less developed soils on slopes because of erosion, but it builds up in the valleys and you can get, here's sort of what you'd imagine to see in a cross section. If you like cut down, we call this a profile. You get a deeper profile down here than up here on the slope. And then finally there's time. So this is sort of a schematic. You can start out with some little mosses, um, some lichen, which are bacteria and fungi working together. And maybe over time, they're gonna eat up some of these rocks and the soil let profile can develop a little bigger, you know, deeper. And then over time, you can get more plants and roots and it develops even deeper. And then you can get these different layers. Um, so it's always changing over time, right? Initially thin, could take a hundred years to form something thin like that. Um, weathering continues, that's this breakdown of rocks and, the, and literally fungi will eat those rocks and then get some nutrients and share them with the others. And it's amazing what, what all these organisms do together to take rocks and turn it into life. Um, soils become deeper, get more organic material. Leaching is the process of um, different materials moving with water, as we say, down the profile. So, you, so if you add fertilizers and you have water, they can leach down the profile. And often, this is sort of the issue, if you add your own nitrogen fertilizer, it might not stay up there in the soil where it needs to be. It can just leach, leach out and wash out. And that's actually what's been happening on a really large scale um, across this country. It's like all of our farmlands in the middle of the country, we spend billions of dollars on nitrogen fertilizers. It all goes down the Mississippi River. And then there's all these nutrients down in the Gulf of Mexico and then algae loves the nutrients. The algae takes over, blocks all the sunlight and the fish die. And we create dead zones. This is a process of eutrophication. So when we're met, like the system knows how to take care of itself. Just have your organic matter there. You don't have to add all of this. But that's sort of this issue with, uh, with leaching and adding nutrients that aren't, you know, you, you maybe don't need to add so many nutrients, but we'll, we'll get there again. Okay, so mature soils can be productive, but... They can also become leached and less productive. Those nutrients can also leave the profile. So the aging process is in general, you know, more rapid and warm, humid climates, slower when it's dry. Um, and overall, now we've got humans. Okay, so we've got all of these soil forming factors and all of these different physical and chemical and biological processes. And then humans are influencing all of them. 
So maybe we're a sixth soil forming factor. And you know, here you know, we can mine, we can just scrape up a whole landscape. We've obviously made cities and we can leave pollutants, but we can also be the source of the parent materials, can change topography. Um, we can remove the earth, make new soil. We also influence what organisms are there. We can cut down organisms like deforestation. We cut down the trees. We change the climate. Obviously we've got climate change. We make our cities really hot. So we influence all of this and also time. We can make a new soil or we can just bury the soil. So we change all of that. So I wanna keep moving through this cause I got a lot more, but basically things can be added to soil. Things can be lost from soil. They can translocate, which means move around soils and they can transform the chemical transformations. So if you think, it, again, it's just all of this is going on all the time. So no wonder it's kind of hard to know like, oh, what's going on in my soil? It's always, influenced by all these factors and they're always changing. So one of the things I like to do is assure people that, you know, you can know your soils and know your plants and just trust that it's complex. It's never just one simple, simple little thing to do. And there's no one right answer in any given situation because there's always so many factors and that's okay. Like we can, I think we can handle the complexity and try things out and we see what works for us in our own situation. Okay. So then again, if you wanted to really classify and look at how they change, I mean, if you go, I, once I started learning about this stuff, like I can't go anywhere without noticing like, oh, look at those different layers in the soil. Like if uh, there's a, like a road cut somewhere, you know, we don't see them all the times in our cities. It's mostly when I drive out of the city, but you can actually see we're in a park or a steep area, you know, you're like, wow, there's all these different layers and different colors and different materials in each layer. And it can go pretty deep. So I'm gonna move through this, but if you're curious about how we classify these soils, those 12 orders and all of the different categories are classified by what's present, what layers are present in the soil. And really this idea then emerged that soil is really a body. It's not just this layer, it's not just the top layer of rocks that promotes plants. It's really a collection of all of these natural bodies. It varies across the landscape and to study soil, pedologists, people who study soil, dig a pit. And the pedon is the smallest unit of soil. It's like you can actually get in it. It's a meter by a meter and a meter and a half. And then people can identify these different traits of the soil to understand what's going on. So here we are in Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx. I grew up right near there, if any of you know it. And that's a pedologist from the USDA. And this is Professor Chang from Brooklyn College. This was one of my first soil pits. <laughs> and we're just, he's climbing in there and he's looking at these different layers. And so this was actually formed on coal ash, right? And, and he's pinpointing these different layers and you can take samples from the different layers and there's handbooks for this. And that's how we understand what's really going on in the soils. Okay, so again, we've got all these factors, all these environmental and human factors determine what's in the soil. And there's sands, like I mentioned from the parent materials, there's organisms, there's water, and that determines all the properties that you might get. So you can send your soil sample to the lab and they can tell you the texture, which is how much mineral, different minerals. You can look at the color, how water moves. You can look at the pH, the nutrients. This is CEC is cation exchange capacity, how they hold on to nutrients. And all of these properties then determine how the soil functions, how they support plants, how they uh, you know, regulate water movement through them and water quality, how they cycle nutrients. And so then when we talk about soil health or soil quality, it's really the capacity of the soil to provide these functions for the human or the natural system, but you have to look at all of it. You're like, how's your soil doing? You might look at well, what's in it, what are the properties? How is it doing for plants? How is water moving? All of this should be taken into consideration when you think about how healthy your soil is. All right, so that's my basic on soil properties. This is like, we could, I, there's whole courses that'll tell you what each of these, <laughs> each of these things mean, what, you know, more about pH and nutrients and all of that. But are there any questions before we move on to contaminants? Well, feel free to stop me or, or put them in the chat if you've uh, 
if you've got some questions. Because basically, again, you know, information to think about what's, what's going on in the soil, all these things happening. Now in our cities, <clears throat> and really all over, but especially in our cities, we have a legacy of lead. Lead, the chemical symbol on the periodic table is PB. So I use that so we know we're talking about this, this chemical, which many people have heard of as being toxic. It's very toxic. It's not harmful. And, you know, the, the amount of lead that was naturally in the earth's crust in the rocks was very low, about 20 parts per million. But here we see a map of soil samples sent to the lab at Brooklyn College. There's so many in Brooklyn because they were sent to Brooklyn College. We didn't go out and sample all the areas. It's just basically who sent their soil samples in. So it's not representative. We would probably have just as many <laughs> of these, you know, red areas if we really went out and looked everywhere. But basically, these are census tract areas where the average lead levels of the sample sent in were above 400 parts per million. So we've got some high levels there. Again, I said the naturally occurring soils, the rocks have 20 parts per million, soils might have 60 parts per million. And parts per million, PPM is like one atom out of a million. Okay, so there's high levels in our cities. And this isn't just New York City, this is everywhere. So also, do you know, fun fact, about 36% of New York City surface is covered with soil. This obviously includes like all the outer boroughs, but you know, it's not Manhattan, but we've got like at least a third of our city covered with soil. Okay, and so even though this isn't a systematic map, we've got high lead in soil all over. The thing about lead is that it's an element, so it doesn't break down. And we can talk a little bit about this, but there's really no effective way to take it out of soil. And so this doesn't just put gardeners at risk for residents, especially kids. Kids are the most at risk for exposure, you know, for harmful effects of lead. But gardeners have been doing this amazing work of building new soil that limits exposure. Because this lead really has come from former, you know, gasoline when it used to have lead in it, comes from paint when it used to have lead in it. Now that paint was banned, but if you have an old building that peels some paint, it's gonna land in soil going to stay there. So this is why we build new soils in the cities. This is why we have raised beds. And gardeners have been doing this work. When we talk about gardeners leading environmental justice, they are making the new soil layers that are cleaner. And so the more we know about this, the more we can work together to limit exposure. So this, as I mentioned, this is an environmental injustice. In general, you see higher concentrations of people, people of color, higher concentrations of people living in poverty, correlated with higher soil lead and higher blood lead in children. So these are from Oakland and this is, you know, trends that we see. And honestly, it doesn't need to keep going like this. We know these trends exist and I think we can do something about it. Many people do too. So there's no need for this to continue. Um, I wanna mention that I talk a lot about lead and here's, you know, some sources of lead. There's all these other potential contaminants but lead is the most common. And if you've, if you've got one of these other contaminants present, you probably got lead. And if you've got lead, we've really got to deal with that because it's, you know, arsenic is another one that's really toxic, but some of the other ones like copper and zinc are only toxic in really, really high levels. So really lead is the one you deal with the most than arsenic, um, but, and it's also easier to test for. So, Keep that in mind. It's not just lead that we're concerned about, but that's the big one. So I often get a lot of questions like, okay, so what do we do? So can we remove it from soil? Has anyone here ever heard of sunflowers removing lead from soil? Good. I'm glad that yes. someone's heard of this. Yes, Sorry. we heard of it. Guess what? Um, we heard about the sunflowers. We are actually growing sunflowers to help the soil. Okay, well, sunflowers are wonderful. They might help the soil, but they are not gonna deal with your lead issue. Sorry to say, this is my job <laughs> to, to like squash the dreams. No, we love sunflowers, but they're not gonna remove enough lead to fix the issue. So good news, it's because they don't take up a lot of lead from their roots. And most plants don't take up a lot of lead from their roots. So that's good, right? That's good news for crops. That's good news for a lot of us, but 
it's sad if you think you're removing it. We can talk more about that if you like um, and why. And I've got some papers out that can give you all the details about it and why there's so many misconceptions because a lot of people have heard about it. And anyway, sorry to say it doesn't work. Can you add amendments to make lead less toxic or less bioavailable in our, in our bodies? And a lot of people add compost for that. And you can certainly add amendments, but it's not clear that it's gonna actually make the lead less harmful. There's different testing methods. And if you, there's a lot of phosphorus in compost that can make arsenic more available. But adding compost is generally a good thing to do if you add not too much. So we love, you know, you can make your soils healthier by adding some compost, no problem. It's not gonna deal with your lead issue. Okay, so can you dig it up and haul it out? Absolutely, if money's not an issue. Uh, but if you may be familiar with what was happening in Red Hook, where there's ball fields on a former lead smelting site. They've been closed since 2015 and it's costing a uh, hundred million dollars to remove the soil. So yeah, if you've got that kind of money and want to do that, go ahead. But it's really challenging. So can you cover it up? Here you see an image of using landscape fabric so the water can drain through and bringing in new soil. This was in a project, a project in New Orleans. Um, that's the way to go. You bring in new soil, you cover the contaminants, you've limited exposure. And I think the, the key is to let people know, hey, don't dig below that. So I don't know about you all, before I got into all this, I would definitely dig down below whatever layers are in the garden where I was working. And then it was like, oh my goodness, that's, that's not a good idea. Um, so we need to pass that information on that we have this history, this often violent legacy, but we can build up on top. Okay, so where do you get new soil? So that brings us to uh, the Clean Soil Bank and so CSB. And so this started as a pilot project um, led by the New York City Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation. And remember I told you that all of Brooklyn and Queens is covered with these glacial deposits. So if you ever see these big development sites, which is a whole other topic we can get into another time, but these development sites where they're mostly building condos, you know, there's all this sand that needs to come up. And this agency, OER, found that a lot of the materials were super, super clean, left here by the glaciers, never been touched by humans. They might have had some contaminated layer on the top, but that would go to a landfill and all the rest of the stuff, they're like, this is great materials. What can we do with it? So they didn't know if it could be used for growing. So we mixed it, we took these mostly sands mix them with compost, brought them to community gardens and East New York Farms. East New York Farms was part of the first pilot study in 2014. We did a study and here's a photo at East New York Farms when that willow tree was there. <laughs> we also, last time I went there, the willow tree was down. But um, we have productive soils. So we found that you can mix these sediments or sands with compost and you get a soil. And they have all the right soil parameters you need with the pH and the nutrients, and the salinity and all of that. Uh, at least 33% compost was good for yield. The crops weren't contaminated. We wouldn't expect them to be here, but we grew them in a garden that had some surrounding contaminants and they were fine and soil metals stayed low. So we kept monitoring them. These beds are now gone, but we've had more follow-ups. Okay, so this is, this is what the stuff looks like from these big sites. There's all this sand that's being dug up that's perfectly clean. And so what folks at East New York Farms did was they realized, you know, these soils actually work. Can we try to distribute them? And so they got a grant from the State Department of Environmental Conservation. And this is at the Wortman Community Garden, which they started from scratch. It was a vacant lot. They got access to the lot. They get these huge deliveries of sediment, I use the technical term, but they're mostly sand. Um, that's David, if any of you all remember David. And they built this community garden here in the back. And so all of the beds here at Wartman are made from these mixtures of sediments and compost. And that's where the trucks come, you know, on the other side and, and dump them. And then they hired folks station to sift and mix the materials because it can have some of these little rocks in it. So you take all the rocks out, load it up in trucks, you know, mixed them with this bobcat and delivered them to community gardens. And we created some more beds for experimenting with different ratios, like how much compost is the right amount of compost? 
So we've been testing out things like that. We went from 25, 50, 75, and 100% compost. Oops. And all the beds here were created with these mixtures. And here's that pile I showed you on our cover image. So after it sits for a while, you can see these different layers. Volunteer plants will come on the surface. And this was before COVID, but a lot of the youth would bag up the soils. And in, in COVID times, Ayashima did a lot of that. <laughs> so, but then people could come and pick it up for free. So I'll just show you actually, here's some next dates that East New York Farms is offering free pickups. It's not until the summer and fall, but they're gonna have, uh, they're gonna have some free soil pickups or giveaways, should be bagged. And now for the first time ever, so all this time since 2013, OER has been saying, you know, we have this clean soil bank. There was no physical bank. You had to be able to receive that huge dump truck load of sediments. But now just this winter, they opened up their own stockpile. It's on for Bell Street and it's also in East New York. And so priorities for East New York residents and growers, but really anyone can go and pick it up. You can't even see how huge this is. It's huge. These are mountains of clean dirt. It's like my favorite place on earth. It's amazing. Um, so you can, you know, look at this website and Google OER, clean soil bank, um, and you can get free clean sediments. Again, they need some compost. They need that organic matter to be a really good growing medium, but they've got those essential minerals right here. Okay, and so if you want your soils tested, you can also send them into the lab at Brooklyn College. You can also Google Urban Soils Lab at Brooklyn College. Um, and these are actually, I meant to have pictures from Eastern Farms. These are pictures with uh, Red Hook youth, but this is a fancy machine that'll test your soils for metals. So I've been able to bring that around too. And we'll probably be able to do that at some of those events in the summer and the fall. Um, I'm gonna, and then there's, um, if you're just curious to join and learn more about local farmer resources, there's an urban farmer to farmer summit, tufts.nyctufts.org. 